Welcome to Social Hour Ministries, where we set the captives free in the name of Jesus. There's some things I've seen recently that I feel led to address. In today's age, there are many people who prophesy and they're quick to say that they are not prophets. And they may be, may be absolutely correct. And then some people are then saying, the Lord said, they'll say, I feel as if the Lord, but both of those two things, or both of those things, are actually meant to cushion a person, to prevent a person from being held accountable like a prophet would be, or should be, and is held accountable. In Ezekiel 3, the Lord told Ezekiel that he should go to the house of Israel. They would be stubborn. They would be hard-hearted. They would not do what he told them to do in the name of the Lord. But at least they would know that a prophet had been among them. Hmm. So he could go there and says and say, Thus say the Lord, nothing has to come to pass. But they would know a prophet had been among them. So there's some people. They'll prophesy a lot. Some people say they prophesy more than biblical prophets. But they'll prophesy a lot. But then they'll fall back by saying, Oh, but I'm not a prophet. Well, whether you call yourself a prophet or not, when you prophesy, you'll be held accountable as such. Because if the Lord hasn't commanded you to speak, you shouldn't speak. Now, there are times when prophets give their opinions, and this is something I am very cautious about, about giving your opinions, because even your opinions can be misconstrued as being the word of the Lord. And it's very appropriate to say, the Lord has not spoken to me about that, so I will not comment on it. But if you find yourself in a, in a situation whether it's internally or externally driven, or a combination of both, where someone asks you a question, and you don't want to come across as if God didn't give you the intel, the intelligence on that, and it may seem as if you are less of a prophet, to just simply say, I don't know. That helps to avoid confusion. It also helps with your accuracy. In Jeremiah 20, Jeremiah said he wouldn't proclaim the word of the Lord. He refused. But the word of the Lord was shut up in his bones as like fire. In Jeremiah 23, 29, Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, like a hammer that breaks rocks to pieces? So there's a burden, and even the Bible speaks about the burden of the word of the Lord. And sometimes the burden people have is the burden, which is the desire to be seen, not because something is being led by the Spirit of God. So they prophesy, and they'll be quick to say, I'm not a prophet. Well, the moment you start prophesying, you're going to help, or you should be held accountable as such. And I know many people have gone to prophetic schools, and going to a prophetic school does not make you a prophet. To me, going to the school of the Holy Spirit, that's what makes you a prophet. You can go to a school, and they can put you through different things. But the only person who can make you a prophet is the Lord. Judas was an apostle. He went through all the things with Jesus. But he never made it to the end. At least the Lord was personally training Judas. Other people followed the Lord, but they were not apostles. They had to be selected as such. In Acts 1, we see how Matthias ended up getting selected to replace Judas. So we can't, for example, go to a school and be called a prophet simply because we graduated from that school. 
if the Lord doesn't recognize you as an, in a certain position, then you're not. But I digress. So there are people who they're prophesying and they're quick to say, but I'm not a prophet. Or rather than saying, thus says the Lord or the Lord said, they would say, I feel as if. If it's only a feeling, it's best to keep that feeling to yourself. I've spoken before, that's what I call um, basically prophetic back chatter. That if you're a prophetic person, you would speak with another prophetic person and say, look, I had this dream, I had this vision, or heard this, or perceived this. Has the Lord said anything to you about this? And that's part of also testing the spirits. That's one thing. But if you go out there and you're on record as, in, as saying something, don't start saying, but I'm a prophet. I have said more than I thought I would because at the heart of this message is this. During this election season here in the United States, many people are being labeled as being false prophets regarding what they prophesied about the outcome of the election. But I won't go into all of that. The part I'll go into is about those who are quote unquote correcting or otherwise chastising those they deem as being false prophets. Because they are people who are in a sense covering for the ones that they call, people are calling false prophets. But the way they're going about covering for those individuals is wrong. Because here's what some people are doing. They're putting out that no one basically can correct a prophet except for a prophet. Or you have to be in a certain position to correct the prophet. That is incorrect. A part of the reason why we are all instructed to test the spirits, to see if it's of God, is so that we can all bring correction. Like Jesus spoke about, if you have an issue with a brother, you go to the person privately. If the person refuses to come into alignment, you take someone else. Third time, you go to the entire church. Paul wrote, rebuke once, twice. Third time, treat like a heretic. So we all have a responsibility to test the spirits. But one of the things people are doing wrong is that they see a word as one that has fallen to the ground and they're coming after prophets or those who've been prophesying and it may not be over yet. But for those who are saying only a prophet or you have to be in a certain position or some people may even say you have to have a relationship with that quote-unquote prophet in order to bring correction. That is not the case. Many years ago, the Lord gave me one rule for correcting prophets or for bringing any kind of correction. The one rule for bringing correction is before you bring correction, ensure you are correct. That is it. Before you bring correction, ensure you are correct. In 2 Samuel 11, we see the story of how David committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband Uriah the Hittite killed. In 2 Samuel 12, the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to rebuke David. David came under the Lord's judgment, the Lord's correction. As a part of that, David's son Absalom rose to power drove David into exile. See, the Lord already had Nathan bring the correction. What we're going to look at is a man named Shimei and how he brought correction. But also part of this is how David handled that correction. So in 2 Samuel 16, start verse 5. When King David came to Bahurim, a man of the family of the house of Saul, Shimei, 
son of Gera, came out and cursed continually as he came. So David, he's from the house of Judah. He replaced Saul as king. Saul is from the house of Benjamin. And Shimei is one of Saul's family members. Now one of the things to look at is, is Shimei, is he after or about God's will? Or is he defending a family member? And he came out and he actually cursed David. Was that appropriate under circumstances? But we continue. And he cast stones as and he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men who or were on his right hand and on his left. Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you base fellow. And as you may be able to tell, this is not my regular Bible. So he was cursing at David, telling him to get out. He was throwing stones at him. By the way, the penalty in the Bible for being a false prophet was being stoned to death. So in a lot of ways, what Shimei was doing seemed appropriate. But also what was his motive behind doing it? And he said, continue by saying, The Lord has avenged upon you the blood of the house of Saul. Is that what the Lord said? The Lord has avenged upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hands of Absalom, your son. Behold, the calamity is upon you, because you are a bloody man. I see this message going to go some places I never thought it was going to go. It's like sometimes I get a message and want to, in a sense, keep it on point. But as stuff comes up, I need to address it. And it's important to be thorough. Shimei said, The Lord has avenged upon you all the blood of the house of Saul. If you are in a position where people are coming at you, their mouth is going to testify against them. Meaning, either they're going to say something and you'll know, yes, that is from the Lord. Or they'll say something and you'll know that is from their flesh. The Lord didn't avenge, avenge any blood from the house of Saul on David. That's also part of the reason why the Lord ensured David had nothing to do with King Saul's death. Abigail even though she didn't use the name of the Lord, she prophesied this in 1 Samuel 25. That's also another thing. Every prophecy doesn't involve using the Lord's name by saying, the Lord said. A person can speak on the Lord's behalf without using his name. So Shimei was saying this was because of the house of Saul. But no, it had something to do with David's adultery. So when people say things as if they're bringing correction, those who are on the receiving end will be able to discern which spirit the person or the people are of. Is it true to coming from the Spirit of God? Because if there's anything off in your statement, it's going to show. And the quote-unquote recipient is going to know. And continuing, Then said Abishai, son of Zeruiah, to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. Hmm. Oh, by the way, David had been driven out of the kingdom, but he was still the Lord's anointed. So it's not like Absalom taking over caused David to lose his anointing. 
or even his, even his favor with the Lord. The king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah? If he is cursing because the Lord said to him, Curse David, who then shall ask, Why have you done so? So look at David's reaction. David didn't say to Bashimiai, Well, he can't curse the king. And he didn't come into agreement with Abishai about off with his head. And thank you, Lord. Also, one of the things about this, when Nathan went to go rebuke David, he told him a story about a rich man taking a poor man's only sheep and killing him. David started mouthing off about the judgment. Oh, he should restore up to four times, and he should be killed. That's what David said. When Nathan said, you are that man, then the one who was bringing down harsh judgment was seeking mercy. And their people, they're quick to render harsh judgment or want harsh judgment against others. But if the roles were reversed, they'd be begging for mercy. But here with David, he didn't say anything about, well, Shimei, you don't, you, you don't have a high enough rank in order to come against me. I'm the Lord's anointed. No, David accepted it with humility, but at the same time, not accepting any nonsense from Shimei. So there's a, a balance. So David's like, if it's the Lord doing this, then let the Lord have his way. David was accepting his punishment in humility. So if you are a prophet and you legitimately missed it, and you know you have, then accept it with humility. But if you are a prophet and things are still unfolding, don't start capitulating. Stay strong, because this goes back to not saying stuff unless you know, or I'll say you're very convinced that it's of the Lord. And you're going to let it play out until the very end. And then and only then will you say, I missed it, yea or nay. It's interesting in 1 Samuel 3, it speaks about the Lord did not allow any of Samuel's words to fall to the ground. In the book of Jonah, Jonah's words fell to the ground, but they were from the Lord. And by the way, this is not to make excuses regarding any prophecies about the election. Because things are going back and forth right now. There is a lot of confusion. And the dust hasn't settled. But a part of this is, those who bring correction or attempting to ensure that you're correct. It is best if you know you have a mandate from the Lord to do so. And not saying you have to be in a certain position to do so. If you are in error, accepting the true correction for the Lord, where it comes from. Peter wrote about Balaam, about how the donkey rebuked him. Sometimes it may come from a donkey, so don't be seated so high that you can't take correction from someone who you perceive is down low. And by down low, I mean, in a sense, beneath you, not the other down low that we use in today's term, today's age. Continuing Second um, Samuel 16. And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who was born to me seeks my life. Hmm. With how much more reason now may this Benjamite do it. Let him alone and let him curse for the Lord has bidden him to do it. It may be that the Lord will look on the iniquity done me and will recompense me with good for his cursing this day. So David and his men went by the road and Shimei went along on the hillside opposite David and cursed as he went and threw stones and dust at him. So Shimei was letting him have it. David spoke about his son was seeking his life. One of the things about Shimei, 
is that the Lord had truly done enough to deal with David. Did Shimei know that David lost his son, the one we call a love child? Did Shimei know everything David had gone through? And was it necessary for Shimei to keep on, in a sense, pouring on David? It's like pouring salt into his wounds. Was it necessary? Also, was it God-driven? See, sometimes people want to pour on others. And in a lot of ways, they've already been through enough. But if they're doing it out of their flesh, as opposed to the Spirit of God, they go overboard. Shimei's cursing David. Let me see here. So Abishai, he wanted to kill Shimei, but David let him go. And sure that if you're in a season where the Lord is disciplining you, that you don't become like Abishai, where everyone who comes against you, you talk to about touch not the Lord's anointed and do my prophecy no harm, that you don't want to take people's heads off because they're coming against you. Accept things with humility. If it's truly from the Lord, then by all means accept it. If people are coming against you and it's not in the Lord's will, trust me, the Lord will deal with them. But be careful that you don't put yourself in a position where you're saying that only a certain type of person can correct you. Because if you start developing a mentality, then those types of individuals are going to correct you. And it's going to be far worse than if someone else was doing it. Oh, thank you, Lord. See, Balaam had a choice. He could listen to the donkey. He could accept the donkey's correction. Or he could accept the correction from the sword of the angel of the Lord. So do you want a donkey to rebuke you or the angel? Because the angel was there to take Balaam's life. So we need humility when accepting correction. But we also need wisdom to not accept quote-unquote correction from those who are not correct. Hmm. Let me see here. So that was 2 Samuel 16. But David's season of correction, it was only a season. Absalom kept pursuing David. His hair got caught in the branches of an oak tree. Joab ended up killing him. And David was about to get restored. See, a lot of times people, when they see you going down, or they perceive that you're going down, they will point fingers at you. Not realizing that they're going to see you coming back up also. So the Shimei who was casting stones at David. Let me see here. In 2 Samuel 19, starting verse 15, it reads, so David returned and came to, to the Jordan. And Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king to conduct him over the Jordan. So David, even though he had been exiled, was still the king, the legitimate king, the Lord's anointed. And Shimei, son of Gera, a Benjamite of Bahurim, hastily came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Was he going to be casting rocks at David this time? And 1,000 men of Benjamin with him. So he had a lot of men. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and 20 servants with him, 
rushed to the Jordan and pressed quickly into the king's presence. And there went over a fair boat to bring over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, son of Gera, fell down before the, before the king as David came to the Jordan. So one moment, Shimei cursing David, casting rocks, and now he's falling on his face. I wonder why. Now, we know the Lord had Nathan rebuke David. Nathan didn't have to fall on his face and apologize for what he did. Nathan was doing things of the Lord, not his own flesh. There was no need for an apology. There was no need for pleading for his life. Oh, and by the way, when Nathan rebuked David, even that was a dangerous thing. Now, David was a good king despite that, um, <laughs> that moment of impropriety. But, for example, Nebuchadnezzar. When Daniel went for Nebuchadnezzar, if Daniel didn't have the correct interpretation for the dream, Nebuchadnezzar could have had him, had him killed. David could have done the same thing with Nathan. But he was submitted to the Lord. So even Nathan going to David, because David was the senior most person in Israel. And there's also another Aaron teaching, for example, like only a prophet can correct a prophet. Well, it's like only a king would be able to correct a king, but the Lord sent a prophet to correct David. So here it is, we see Shimei taking on a different posture. And I wonder why. And said to the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity to me and hold me guilty, nor remember what your servant did the day my lord went over to Jerusalem. May the king not take it to heart. So if what Shimei was doing beforehand, he would need to apologize. If what he was doing beforehand was of the Lord, he would need to apologize. He was kicking a man that he thought was down. But it was only for a season. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am today the first of all the house of Joseph to come down and meet my lord, the king. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Oh, Shimei wanted to introduce him to the business end of his sword. We see how, correction on Abishai wanted to put Shimei to the business end of his sword. We see how Shimei had taken on a different posture. Abishai, not so much. He still wanted to deal with Shimei harshly. But David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should be an adversary to me today? Shall anyone be put to death today in Israel? For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? A part of that, there are times you don't have to do things to try to show who you are. When you know who you are, it's like there's nothing to prove. Now, thank you, Lord. Um, a part of this. There's a parallel between when Jesus first started his ministry versus when he was ending. When Jesus was first starting his ministry, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And one of the things the devil was saying, if you are the Son of God, do this. If you are the Son of God. And Jesus already knew he was the Son of God and he had nothing to prove to the devil. And he didn't even need to get offended. At the end of Jesus' ministry, when he was on the cross, you hear the same thing again. If you are the Son of God, come down and we will believe you. 
that same mocking spirit like Shimei. Jesus kept on with his assignment. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. But the same mocking spirit, if you are the Son of God, turn stone to bread. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe you. The Lord stuck to his assignment. So when you know who you are, you don't have to try to prove it. For all those who doubted that Jesus was the Son of God, oh, they found out. They found out. So again, for do not I know that I am this day king over Israel. Therefore, the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. However, when you read in 1 Kings, chapters 1 and 2, you will see that before David died, David had a score to settle with some people. And David told his son Solomon, who succeeded him, do not let <laughs> Joab, Shimei, and I think it was Abiathar the priest, basically, do not let him go down to the grave with the gray hair. And Solomon, he set up something for Shimei, a restraining order. Stay in your village, do not leave. If you leave, you will die. Shimei went after some loose animals. When he came back, Solomon had him brought in, and Shimei died. So David, he had mercy on Shimei, but he didn't take it lightly what he had done. And on his deathbed, one of the persons that he spoke about was Shimei. So Shimei's life was saved, but it doesn't mean he was off the hook. And that is not a veiled threat to anyone, because whether we're on the giving or the receiving end, we have roles and responsibilities. If we're going to dish out stuff, ensure that the Spirit of the Lord is leading us, and not we're doing things for our own flesh. Because sometimes people are trying to pull others down because they're trying to bring themselves up. Shimei may have seemed like an instrument of God, but he was more of an instrument of the devil. David, he knew he had done wrong. He knew he was on the Lord's judgment. And he had suffered a lot. He lost his child that he had with Bathsheba, the first son. He lost his kingdom. By this time, his son had slept with his ten concubines. He had seemingly lost the favor of God. And Shimei was going above and beyond. And it wasn't the Lord who told him to do it. Shimei had his own agenda. He was cursing David one moment, and the next moment he was pleading for his life. But David accepted all that with humility. And he learned his lesson, as you can see in um, Psalm 51. But a lot of times people are quick to condemn. And it's not because of the Spirit of the Lord. A lot of times people, when they're being corrected, they're quick to retaliate. And that's not the way the Lord would have us go. David was humbled and he accepted it with humility. He didn't say you had to be on a certain level to, to correct me. So again, the thing the Lord revealed to me many years ago about bringing correction is to first be correct. In bring correction, the first thing is to be correct. Because if you're not correct, then the Lord is going to deal with you. Also another thing, and this is spiritual warfare based, there are some people out there that you think you're just going to take upon yourself 
to bring correction. And if you correct those individuals, especially publicly, you're going to need, you're going to need the Lord's protection because they're working in occult powers and they'll come after you in, in ways you never imagined. And that's something people don't think about sometimes. Is this my assignment to come against this individual? You may start calling out people, oh, so-and-so is a witch, so-and-so is a warlock, whatsoever the case may be. Well, if the person is, you may be saying, well, the blood of Jesus covers me. You may have entered into a territory the Lord didn't send you into. The Lord sent Nathan to correct David. He didn't send Shimei. So part of being correct is not that you're correcting correction, is that you're correct because the Lord has actually given you assignment to correct, which means he's also giving you protection if you're coming against someone who's working for the other side, the kingdom of darkness. Because Satan actually protects his own. So again, part of the overarching theme of this, overarching team, theme, is before you bring correction, to be correct. Another thing, if you are on the receiving end of correction, godly correction, is to accept it with humility. And by accepting it, it doesn't necessarily mean that whatever the person says, you do, or you say, oh yes, you're correct. It doesn't mean that. If there's something you need to change, change it. Take things to the Lord in prayer, if necessary. But don't start shielding yourself by saying, oh, you can't, you can't correct me because you're not a prophet. Or you can't correct me because I said I was not a prophet. Or you can't correct me because, well, I didn't use the Lord's name. I just said I felt like. No, because we would all have to give an account to the Lord. And in front of him, or in front of him, there's no excuse. So whatever you need to learn from this, I pray that you do. And as I was speaking, I was learning too. Not necessarily that I was learning anything new. Maybe it was just a refresher. But I pray this message blesses you. And that we all get things right with the Lord. Because on this side of life, or at this point in time, in a sense we can make mistakes and repent. But a time is coming when we have to give an account of ourselves to the Lord. <laughs> At that point in time, we need to be correct when we stand in the presence of the Lord to give an account of ourselves. Hmm. In the book of Job, Job says some things when the Lord corrected him, rebuked him, and said that, Who speaks? basically without the counsel of God because Job was speaking from his flesh not the spirit of God and none of us want to be in the position where we're doing things and it's not backed by the Holy Spirit so again I pray this message blesses you if you are rendering correction do it with humility don't be like oh I got it now or I got her now because sadly, there were people who followed Jesus' ministry and they did it for one reason, to catch something errant, either in his words or his deeds, so they could accuse him. Imagine standing before Jesus and you have to explain to him why you saw everything he did, but you're there trying to catch something by saying, see, I knew he was a false prophet. I knew he wasn't the son of God. To the point where you see that he is the son of God and you refuse to accept it because you have your own agenda. And there are people today who are doing the same thing, following people's ministry, just so they can say, I knew he wasn't real or I knew she wasn't real. We will have, all have to give an account to the Lord. So again, before you bring correction, ensure you're correct. When you're receiving correction, do so in humility. Don't start saying, you can't correct me because you're not so-and-so, or you're not in this position. On both sides, we need humility.
God, he gives grace to the humble, but he still opposes the pride or the proud. God bless you. Jesus is Lord.